Hello, and welcome to Game Face Inside the Minds of Great Competitors. My name is Lindsay Wilson, and I am the founder of Positive Performance Mental Training and a High Performance Coach. And I am so excited that you're here. Webinar day is one of my favorite days um, doing what I do because I get to connect and teach and share and learn from great coaches such as yourself. So for the next hour, I am really diving into the things that I've learned, not only as a mental training coach for the last 10 years, but in my career as a player and coach for let's see, the last 30 or so. Um, and I'm really going to dive into the tools that have worked um, both for me and for my clients. And so I'm really excited to share that with you. But before we get started, I want to talk a little bit more about what brought me here. Um, because I think the why uh, for me of mental training is super important and maybe something that you, you all can relate to as well. Um, probably like a lot of you, I am passionate about sports. Uh, they completely changed my life and anything that I can do to give back to the sports community is something that I'm on board with. But in particular, mental training was, was really formative in my life. Um, I would not be an entrepreneur. I would not have played professional basketball. I would not have played collegiate basketball without it. And I remember specifically when I was, um, I had just turned 16 years old and I had these really, really big dreams to play in college. And I was doing the physical work necessary to do that. I was getting up at 5.30 in the morning with my dad. I, ha I was playing against the boys all the time. I was running hills. I was shooting after practice. Like I was doing everything. I look back and like, I can honestly say I was doing everything physically, but I was experiencing a lot of the struggles and the barriers that I see pretty consistent, consistently in that it was all mental. Like I would play great one game, not great another. I was holding myself back. I was worried about what other people were thinking. I felt a ton of pressure to accomplish these goals, um, internal pressure. My, my parents weren't pressuring me at all. Um, they were just on board with my goals. And, and I, f I could feel my goals and my dreams slipping away. And I remember this moment of after a tournament, just bawling my eyes out and feeling like, maybe this isn't for me. You know, maybe, maybe I can't do this. And, and I, I felt that, that, that tug of maybe it's better if I just quit. And, and by quit, I don't mean I was going to like quit the team. It was, it was worse. It was like, I was going to quit on myself. And I had this last sort of like shred of hope that I was just like, no, like I, I got to find a way. Right. And my mom actually found me a mental training coach. And I can honestly say from the first moment I met with him that everything changed. It was like a light bulb went off in that I was like, oh, okay, everybody struggles with these mental things and that there's a solution. Oh my God. And it's not that it was an overnight, well, it happened really fast actually, but it's not that it was necessarily an overnight fix. I mean, there were still so many ups and downs throughout my whole career, really, um, as most athletes will admit to. But that moment of having that coach teach me that I was in control of my mind, that's really what I want to teach you so that you can teach your athletes. And um, and so my whole life changed after that. And it, it led me on this path to play collegiately, to play professionally, to be an entrepreneur, and really to pay it forward and try to teach the things that really changed my life to other athletes, coaches, and even parents. And so that's where, where I'm coming from. And, um, and, and so I'm not holding anything back. Um, I, I really like to share the things that have worked for me and the work, things that have worked for my clients. And uh, that's me in my office is here in Seattle. Um, that's me playing professionally on the right hand side and um, actually in high school that was when we went to the state championship um, So that's where I'm coming from but you know because of that I am really passionate about sharing this stuff and so um, I'll do a Q&A &A, Q at the end, but I don't mess around like you are going to get Tools today. This is not just a bunch of fluff. So I really encourage you to you know put your phone down or turn off Facebook or whatever else is going because I know a lot of us multitask and really focus because for the next hour, most of you, I've done this masterclass a lot and most people say they're taking notes the entire time because I am going to give you the tools that, have, that work, that flat out work. And I will say, you know, I, I had a lot of experience playing um, basketball, but this is what I do and this is what I, um, this is what I focus on. 
you know, and I, I think a lot of coaches, especially ones that come and, and try to work with us or, or look at our trainings, are passionate about mental training and understand that the mental component is really important. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time convincing you of that because if you don't believe that, you probably, this isn't for you. But, but what they don't know is how to teach it. So they're great at being competitors themselves, but sometimes when you're good at something, it's actually really hard to teach it. And that's really what we do is we break it down so that you can understand like how you became a great competitor and what things maybe that you already do naturally that maybe you don't know you know or you do. And so you can't teach it to your athletes because you don't know what you do. I kind of think about like, I, had a, I have a really, I should say have, because I still play. I had a great jump shot, a great like 15 foot pull up jump shot. I don't know that I'm that great at teaching it. You know, like if I really sit down and think about, well, my life, my left foot goes, my right foot goes, and then I got my elbow in. Like that's different than being able to do it, right? And sometimes, sometimes people are actually better at teaching it that, that can't do it. And so, um, you know, just because you're a great competitor, just because you kind of get this stuff doesn't mean that it's so easy to teach as I'm sure you've experienced yourself. <laughs> so that, that's what I can pr promise to you is for the next hour, I'm going to give you actionable proven tools and a real system that you can use with your athletes. And I'm also going to give you a special mental training package offer at the end. So definitely want you to stay for that because it's not something that you can find really anywhere else in our trainings. Okay. But I do know that everyone's busy. So I want to make sure that for the next hour that it's really targeted for you and that this is something that you're going to get a lot out of. So who I designed this masterclass for is if you say things like, I don't know how to get my athletes fired up for games. Um, again, maybe you know how to get fired up, but like your athletes are half asleep and you don't know what to do, or you've tried things and it didn't work. Your team doesn't know how to compete when the pressure is on. And a lot of you guys, if you took the poll, if you signed up late, you might not have gotten the poll question, but thank you for answering those questions. A lot of these came from that. And, and honestly, there's no surprises. I've done this for a long time, but it's still good for me to, to understand where each one of you is coming from. So a lot of coaches will say their team doesn't know how to compete and, and even worse when the pressure is on, which, you know, if you're trying to accomplish anything, there's going to be pressure at some point. This is a really frustrating one. Athletes can't recover from a bad start. So as a coach, you know that if the first part of the game or the race doesn't go well, they don't know how to recover. And so you're sitting on the sidelines or wherever and you're like, oh, just, you know, fight. And they don't know how to kind of get back into that. So you're always kind of waiting for that first couple minutes of, of the game or the race to like figure out who's going to show up that day. And that can be really frustrating. Your athletes just don't flat out have the confidence. And, and again, it's something that maybe you have or that you've developed or worked on and, and you're trying to give it to them, but it's not working and you don't know how to sort of get that out of them. And you know, it's a crucial piece. This is probably the biggest frustration that I see from coaches is they just don't know. They don't know who's going to show up. Like, did someone wake up on the right side of the bed or not? And again, you're putting in all this work and practice and training and maybe scouting and, you know, all these things. And then it's sort of like a roll of the dice. And that can be really aggravating. Your team plays down to the competition or they get intimidated by opponents that are quote unquote better and they really don't even ever give you a chance. Okay. So what we're going to cover today, I'm breaking it up into three main parts. Again, this is, I really try to make it, um, you know, I mean, just as a teaching in general, so that's really easy for you to understand and really easy for you to, to take some tools back to your athletes. First, I want to talk about mindset. And, and a lot of people, you know, throw around terms about mental toughness and mental training and aggressiveness and, you know, all these things. And in my experience, the verbiage really matters. And, you know, when I say mental toughness, it might mean something different than you. Or when I say a great competitor, it might mean something different than what it means to you. And it's certainly going to mean something different than what your athletes think. And so I think defining things and really understanding what that mindset is that we're looking for, and we have to define what we're looking for before we can find it, right? Or develop it. Um, the common barriers that I'm seeing, um, again, I think it's important to understand that. And one of them might surprise you. Um, and then the tools. And again, I'm not holding back on the tools, so I really want you to get some things to take back to your team. Okay. Um, let's talk about mindset. All right. So uh, we just switched to a new system. So I think the Facebook comments are below. Um, but if you can right now, and Chantel is standing by on Twitter as well, posit at Positive Perform, and she will be sending me, if you could put in the chat or tweet us what makes a great competitor, she's going to send me some of these. 
Um, and if I don't get to yours, um, I will try to pop into the comment section later. It's hard for me to kind of do both while I'm um, teaching, but I think it's important whether you put it in the chat or not, and I hope that you do, um, is to really think about your definition, okay? And so I'm gonna read off a few. John says his definition is the ability to play your best no matter what the situation. Like that one? Coach Cox, every choice of daily life are made with competition in mind. Sacrifices are made happily. Eric, train systematically to maximize performance at the right time. Jackie, people who strive to become their best, helping their team become their best and strive to work harder than anyone else on the team. So I like all of these. You know, I think, um, again, it's, I don't know if there's any right answer, but I think it is important to define it and talk about it with your team and help them define it. Because otherwise we're just throwing words around, right? And we all have kind of different ideas about what that is. So for me, being a great competitor really comes down to one thing, and that is the ability to control one's mind. Now this might sound like a kind of different definition, but if you think about it, great competitors are not just the Serena Williams and the Lindsey Vons and the, um, the Currys. You know, it's, it's really about that person, however successful they are, being able to be in control, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of what's happening. You know, I think about in college, um, we had a, a walk-on that, you know, never played. She was never going to get the results. She was, her name was never going to be in the paper. And, and she was one of our best competitors. She had the ability to completely control her mind. And it wasn't caught up in all these external things, maybe because she knew she wasn't going to play. But regardless, you know, thinking about great competitors and thinking about everyone on your team and everyone in your program, that they can learn this, whether they're the first, you know, star player, the last person off the bench or on the scout team, the ability to control one's mind. And when that becomes the goal, it becomes one achievable for everyone. And it becomes more of a choice and more of something that you can develop. So we'll talk a little bit later about sort of nature versus nurture, because there is a component to that. It's not all a choice, but, um, and Courtney Thompson is, uh, was uh, an Olympic volleyball player and she works with us. She's been a client of us. She's done a lot of our trainings. Um, she's done training for us. Um, but Courtney's story is really interesting because she's a great competitor. There's no doubt about it. If you're in the volleyball world, you already know Courtney and just the way that she talks and lives and, and is, she's a great competitor. But, you know, I think one of the things that I'm so proud of her for is she was a great competitor. She was player of the year um, in college. She was on the Olympic team. And, and then towards the end of her career, she was on the Olympic team for one reason. And that's because she was a great competitor. She was a great leader. She was a great person to have on the team. And she wasn't playing as much. Uh, she wasn't playing very much at all, um, from what I understand. And so, you know, she'd been the big star. And yet, towards the end of her career, she wasn't necessarily the big star. And that ability to control her mind and not get caught up in that, to me, is like the best example of her competitive spirit. Because she was all about the team, all about, you know, the team doing well and, and, and really understanding her role. And, and so, again, regardless of what position different athletes are in, that they have the potential to be a great competitor. And that's really what it comes down to is the ability to control one's mind. And, and so I think when you distill it down to that, it's a lot easier to understand and, and achieve. So let's talk about the fight or flight response. Uh, the uh, sympathetic nervous system gets riled up. And, you know, this might not be something that is new to you, it probably isn't, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into this a little bit more and, you know, really start thinking about, do your athletes understand this? So the fight or flight response is obviously something that's really important to our general survival, but it's also something that's really important to performance. Because when we go into a competition, we likely need that adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol release to perform at our best, right? But there's some physiological reactions, as you well know, you know, dry mouth, sweaty palms, having to pee a million times before games, uh, accelerated heart rate you know, your digestion shuts down. And so all these different things are happening in your body when your body goes into this fight or flight response. And they can be a little bit uncomfortable, right? Especially if um, you're not used to it. And, but a lot of it is your perception of the fight or flight response. 
And so we have to understand that this is an important part of competition, but that we can also manage it. So one of the things that you, you might be familiar with is um, some research called um, by Yerkes Dodd. And this actually wasn't done in athletics. It was done for just peak performance. And basically what they said and what they found in this research was that everybody has an optimal level of arousal. Let's call that being hyped up, okay? So you can think of right here, quality of performance. Zero being your worst performance, your worst game, and 10 being your best. And obviously 10 is what we're going for. And then you can think of your level of arousal being zero being kind of half asleep and 10 being like, I'm ready to run through a brick wall. Now, for you, you're a coach, you have an adrenaline release before games. Where is your optimal level? Like when you're coaching your best, are you more on the, I want to run through a brick wall? Or are you more on the, like, I'm really relaxed? And just think about that. And then think about your athletes. Where do they need to be? I'll tell you my sort of awareness with all this, just to give you an example. So I was, when I played my best, I was like at a seven, maybe eight. I was the kind of person that was like pretty pumped to play, pretty excited. And so, uh, Honestly, I did better when we had sort of bigger games and more pressure, and I, I struggled a little bit when we had games that I thought we were just going to blow the other team out. That was actually more of a challenge for me, and some people are the opposite. Um, so if I was – so the key with this is that athletes first have to be aware of where they are supposed to be, what has worked for them in the past, um, and there's generally going to be a pattern. Then understanding before each game, where are they? Are they above that number or are they below that number? And finally, and they should be there the same number, roughly, regardless of the competition, which is the hardest part. And finally, what to do if they feel above that level or below that level. So for me, if I was like a nine, I would go in the game and <laughs> drive my coaches crazy. I would take a bad shot. I would turn the ball over. I would foul someone. Um, I was almost playing too, too fast. I had too much adrenaline. I was too pumped up. Okay. But if I was too relaxed, I just was off. Like my timing would be off. I wasn't sharp on defense. You know, I might think before diving on the floor for a loose ball. Uh, I was a little hesitant maybe. And I just didn't have that focus that I needed for peak performance. And you might recognize this in your athletes and in your team in general. And this, this is a pretty simple concept, obviously, but this is really important because this is what most athletes do, right? Is they show up for the game. Maybe they have a routine, maybe they don't. And they wait until the first part of the race to decide how they're gonna do that day or the first part of the game to decide how good they are at soccer that day. And they don't know why they play well or why they don't or what their mindset's supposed to be. And a lot of it's determined by the opponent. And so no wonder you have that feeling where you don't know who's going to show up before games or races because you don't. And they don't either. And so this concept can be really, really important. But I want to talk a little bit, go a little bit deeper. So that's the Yerkes Dodd. That's called the inverted U theory. And you can think of it as just the, the arousal level or the hyped up level that you need to be to play at your best, okay? So a couple things, though, to go a little bit deeper. There's two things that are really important. One is the brain's perception of threat. And this can be different, very different, depending on what level they're at. So for example, a, you know, a little league pitcher might feel more pressure than Courtney in the Olympics because perception's reality to them, right? And so you might think, well, it's a little league game, like pressure, come on, I have a mortgage, right? <laughs> but it doesn't matter. What the brain's perception, what you're, what you're feeling is, is reality to you. So understanding that pressure is, is relative is really important. But I, the second thing is maybe even more important, and that's this. The brain's perception of the body's reaction to stress is really important. Let me clarify. So 
if you have a player or an athlete that feels this pressure, whether you think they should or not, they feel this pressure, and then their body reacts, right? They get the butterflies, they get the sweaty palms. Their perception of their body's reaction matters. So do they think that's a good thing? Or do they think, uh-oh, I'm nervous. It's not going to go well today. Or do they think, oh, butterflies, that means, that means I'm ready. You see, those are two very different approaches. And we're going to talk about some, some tactics that you can use with your team to help them move into like, this is a good thing. My body's reaction now, obviously too much adrenaline, too much of that arousal is bad, as we talked about already. We don't want people throwing up before games, but a little bit of butterflies, that's good. But their perception has to be that, okay? This is a really, really important concept. Why is this important? So I'm kind of a nerd. I look at, there's actually not that much research in sports psychology, but there's a ton in things like neuroplasticity and stress and performance in general. And so one study that I looked at, and this is actually a TED Talk, and I'll give you the name in a couple slides of the woman that actually did this TED Talk. But basically what they said is, we're going to do this eight-year study, um, and a couple of things are going to happen. So we're going to ask people, how much stress have you experienced in the last year? A little bit, moderate amount, or a severe amount? And then we're going to ask them, do you believe stress is harmful for your health? So what is their perception of their body's reaction to stress? Do you think it's good for you or do you think it's bad for you? Bad news first. <laughs> there was an increased risk of dying for the people that had severe stress. So I'll also take a deep breath. <laughs> but, and this is, this like blew my mind. That was only true for the people that believed stress was bad for them. Let me just go over that again. Their perception of whether stress was good or bad determined how their body reacted to that stress. So if they thought stress was good for them, which I kind of had that opinion too, um, they had no increased risk, even if they had severe stress. So your perception of stress is important. And this is Dr. Kelly McGonigal. She's the one that did the TED Talk if you're interested in looking at that. Um, and basically what she says is how you think about stress matters, okay? So how your athletes view stress matters. So what does this mean? Well, <laughs> it means we have a lot to teach athletes. Uh, so for athletes to compete at their best, I believe they need two main things. One is that knowledge base, that awareness. Where do I need to be before games? And then how do I get there if I'm not there sort of naturally? Um, and so let's talk about how to do that. So one really simple way, and this is just kind of gives you that awareness of where their knowledge is and where your, the culture of your team is when it comes to this, is do your athletes believe that butterflies are a sign that they're ready? Or do they believe that only weak athletes get butterflies? I talked about that earlier, but that's a pretty big difference. Do I believe that I'm ready or is this a sign that I'm not, this isn't going to go well? Do they talk about nervousness as being excited or do they think they should avoid nerves? A lot of athletes want to avoid nerves. They think, ooh, you know, that's, that's not comfortable and so I'm not, I don't want to even go there. So, I, yeah, maybe I don't care that much. How do you and your program talk about competition and mental preparation? Do you talk about it? Okay, so let's talk about some of the barriers that I'm seeing um, when it comes to athletes really getting this competitive mindset. Now, you might be thinking, and this is not wrong, aren't some athletes just better at this stuff than others? Aren't they just better at competing? And I will tell you that yes, some are. <laughs> you are correct. What the research shows is up to 25, 25 to up to 50% of our mindset may be based on genetics, okay? But if you switch that the other way, that means that at the wor in worst case scenario, half of our mindset is based on choice, practice, and stimuli and experience, okay? So at the very worst, you have half of their mindset to work on, which is really good news. 
So the barriers that I'm seeing, obviously, a lot of them are interior, or, or interior. Um, a lot of them are exterior, and, and sometimes it's hard to determine both. But let me give you a couple frameworks of things to think about. For the interior, it, it is kind of funny because the interior are, are sometimes externally based. So this is the athlete that is extremely results based, like to the extreme, right? They get way too nervous, or they get, or they play down the competition because all of their focus is on, on whether they're going to win or not. And the results. So they might have a great, um, they might have a great, let's say, let's say they PR, they're swimming, let's say they PR, but they lose and they're devastated. Or let's say they win, but they didn't do very well and they're, but they're fine with it. And so it's all about the results. And so this makes it really difficult for them to improve. It makes it really difficult for them to have a lot of self awareness. Um, and, and they have a lot of ups and downs. And so, you know, sometimes you do get that great competitor out of this person, but it's very iffy and their focus is kind of all over the place. On the other extreme, you have the person I call them too cool for school. And, um, you know, there's a lot of sort of variance in between these, but it's, sometimes it's helpful to just kind of think, see of like two main issues that I see. This is the athlete that pretends not to care and they don't want to risk anything. And this is a lot of fear based, right? because they're really uncomfortable with nerves. So they're the kind of athletes that says, I don't, I don't, I do better when I don't think about it, or I do better when I'm silly before games. And so they want to, they don't, they don't want to give it their all because they're just really too scared to. And so it's really hard for them to find their peak performance because they're not even getting up to the level that they need to be. They'll also be the ones that if you talk to them about the inverted view theory and how aroused they need to get, they, they'll say, I do way better when I'm relaxed, but they might not. They might actually need to be more pumped up, but they're so uncomfortable with nerves that they never want to get there on their own. And the final barrier, well, my thing just dropped. Um, the final barrier is, and this is a little bit of a come to Jesus, is that coaches, and that means you, have to expect amazing. And that's why I talked to you a little bit about you know, whether this is sort of genetic or not, right? And, and some of you might say, well, I see athletes and some are better competitors than others. That's fine. But there's still half of their mindset that you can expect amazing out of. You can expect so many great things. And, and really, when coaches don't, it is very hard for athletes to change. And so a lot of this comes down to you really diving into your own mindset with this and expecting amazing, positive, awesome results. And not getting frustrated when that'll happen overnight, but really making sure that your mindset is there. Because I will tell you this, I've worked with a lot of athletes over many, many years. And athletes are both completely clueless, completely, as you know, and also very knowledgeable. So what do I mean by that? I mean, athletes don't know what they don't know. If they're not, if someone's not helping them ask the right questions, they don't even know what the question is, you know? Uh, so once you, but once you start asking them like, okay, when you think about your best competitions, how pumped up or relaxed were you? And get them talking about it. And once you ask the right question, they have so much knowledge in them. They have so much self-awareness. I am actually constantly blown away by athletes that I, you know, maybe think that they haven't paid attention to this stuff before. Maybe they haven't, but they actually have a lot of knowledge. And so I, I encourage you to expect that because you'll see, you'll see. <coughs> okay. Tools, the three P's, excuse me. This is where I'm going to give you three things to really take back to your team. Okay. So Let's talk about pivoting. Again, I already gave you some examples, but making sure that your program, the way you talk about competition and nerves, make sure that it is reframed in the positive. So, you know, those are all, and maybe even talk about your own experience getting nervous and how much that helps. And once you go into the inverted U theory, um, the research I think really helps too, even if they're not super research based people. Um, understanding that, that the research actually tells us that nerves are a good thing. And then again, going back to your own 
sense of like, do you truly believe that your athletes can change? Because if you don't, that is going to be a huge barrier and you're not even going to know it. Okay, practicing. Again, how are we getting athletes to that level of arousal? If they're only experience it, experiencing it come game day, well, that's hard. And it is hard to replicate. Don't get me wrong. But um, it's important to at least think about how to replicate it in other ways. So one of the things that I see, you can think of, and, and this is what the research shows actually, is if you think of being confident and anxious on a teeter-totter, when you're feeling more confident, you're feeling less anxious. And when you're feeling more anxious, you're actually feeling less confident. And, and there's some hormonal changes as well. But you can think of, you know, when you're confident, you're also more open to um, taking more risks and you're more optimistic and positive. And, and obviously the opposite is true when you're, when you're anxious. What I see a lot is athletes being pretty anxious when it comes to competition and therefore their confidence is low. And then what happens in practice? They're feeling more confident and their anxiety is low, but then they don't get to practice that feeling of being anxious. Okay. So really we want that to be almost, I don't know, necessarily the opposite, but we want to get a little bit more anxiety in practice, a little less anxiety in competition, a little bit, maybe less confident in practice, although that sounds weird, but just put, putting in more uncomfortable situations, I guess is the better way to put it and getting that confidence up for competition because conf confidence in competition is super important as you know but a lot of times people feel that anxiety and it's like anxiety is going up confidence is plummeting and so they're like all these new feelings and all these nerves and one way for you to think about it is by making sure that that arousal level that they're getting to a, a higher arousal level in competition so if you look at the arousal levels one through five let's start at the bottom level one is like just general fitness. Like you might get a little bit of adrenaline rush if you're going to go work out, but it's not like a huge amount. Then you got practice where you got coaches there, you have some expectations. And so your arousal is probably gonna be up a little bit more. Then you have test day, you know, whether that's a two mile run or whether that's a drill that you have to do a certain way in a certain time. And then you have level four, which is regular competition. Then you have level five, which is um, a major championship. And those are hard to replicate. So the obvious thing to do that all of us can do is increase adrenaline, you know, the adrenaline release in practice. And one great way to do that is to increase those sort of test days. And by test days, I mean, again, it can be anything that gets your athletes more aroused in practice. So that could be, you know, you see, you hear coaches like playing loud music, you hear coaches yelling, um, different drills. You know, my coach used to, um, make really bad calls in practice or like give the ball, the other, give the ball to the other team just in the middle of the play, just things to sort of piss us off. Right. And get that sort of adrenaline rush of like, that's not fair. And, and then we would have to control our minds. Right. And so any time that you can do that and then talking about it, right. So like if we did a lot of, you know, basketball, there's a lot of like shooting drills where you have to make like a certain amount of in a row or something like that. And feeling that pressure, a lot of, um, coaches will or have free throws at the end where everybody has to make a free throw. Anything that you can do to get that stress response, and it's going to be obviously different um, depending on sports. And I know you guys are already doing this, but just do it more. You know, think of other more creative ways to get your athletes stressed during practice. And then obviously they need some tools to deal with that. So that they don't go into, into, into competition and that's like the first time they felt nervous. Okay. So prepare. So this is what we teach in our psychology of competition training and our competition mastery for athletes is pre, during, and post competition routine. So one of the great ways to control your mind is through routines because once you establish a routine, and this is true for not just sports, obviously, is it puts you into that mind state right away. That's why we love it. That's why we love our positive routines, right? That's why you love I don't know, having coffee or, or whatever routine, it has a, a sense and a feeling of comfort and the mindset when you do it is the same pretty much every time and you don't have to try, you know? So pre, during, and post-competition routines are really important. We don't have time to go into each one of these, 
Um, but if you enroll in any of our courses, you'll go deep into these and you'll have the time to do that. But one that I want you to walk away with, and this is probably one of my favorites and one of the ones that coaches are constantly contacting us and just being like, oh, my athletes love this. This is changed. Literally, I get this has changed our program. So again, if you're doing something else, pay attention. This is a good one. Um, okay, so a mistake ritual consists of all or some of these things, a reset word, a hand signal, and a deep breath. For me, um, my reset word was a phrase and it was be present. I would do this with my hands, like almost like a little yoga thing, and I would take a deep breath. So uh, anytime there was a timeout, if there was a, um, a dead ball, if there was a turnover, halftime, uh, water breaks in practice, I would take a deep breath, I'd say be present, and I'd breathe out. Now, that sounds like simple. Like, why do you actually need somebody to teach that to you? It is so powerful because really what happens is most athletes, especially when they make a mistake, what happens? They don't have any mind control. Their mind goes on what I call the negative train. And I know you've seen this. They are gone. <laughs> it's like that mistake turns into negative thoughts, which turn into worry, which turn into anxiety, which turn into worse performance. And the snowball effect happens and the downward spiral happens. A mistake ritual grabs them and makes them be there in control of their mind. Now, this is not something like any mental training that you're just going to throw over the wall and you're going to be like, all right, guys, we have a mistake ritual. This is what Lindsay taught. Take a deep breath, say, be present, and um, you know, do your hand like this. Like, they're not going to get it. And so the mistake ritual really has to be taught. It, it, they have to understand the why behind it. And then they have to have the ownership of choosing their own word, choosing their own hand signal. And I'll talk about some examples here in a second. Um, and then it has to be repeated. This is not a one-time thing. Everybody wants to ask me, Lindsay, okay, if I miss a penalty kick, what do I do? I say, well, <laughs> it's like trying to get in better shape in the middle of the game. Like, it's kind of too late. You have to do this stuff ahead of time. It's like stretching. You do it every day, and it becomes part of your routine. You try to do it once in a while, not going to work. It's not going to work. So a couple examples. So it really depends on the sport. Um, so like a swimmer, for example, is not going to do a hand signal. They might not even take a deep breath because they're you know, trying to time their breathing anyway, but they can visualize this mistake ritual. And in practice, they can do it all the time. And by the way, it's not just for mistakes. I call it a mistake ritual because that's when it's the most powerful, but it's something that you're going to be practicing really anytime you get an opportunity. So water breaks are great, timeouts, um, in between drills and practice and, and reminding your athletes to do it. Um, hand signals are great. Some do like a brush off. I mean, you can really do anything, you tap on your head, anything that gives that, that um, body connection. Um, or it can be something even more discreet. You know, you could just tap your fingers together. Um, words, you know, everybody's going to choose their own. There's no magic word. Um, a lot of people will say something like confident or unstoppable or here and now, something like that. Um, I've even had athletes use animals, like if they wanted to be really aggressive and that was sort of their mind state that they need to stay on. Um, they can use tiger or lion, something like that, but really it doesn't matter. It's more about them, t you and your team taking the time to, um, to really decide and think about it and then practice it. And also you can use this as well. So a lot of coaches, right? You need to control your mind in the middle of competition. Like <laughs> I've seen some of you coach, like you have high emotions too. So this is a great thing. You know, a lot of Coaches come in and they're like, I need to work on my body language. Or I need to work on not reacting because my athletes totally, um, you know, play off what they, their, my body language or, or my reaction to something. It's like if they make a mistake and they see me upset, then it's, you know, it's bad. And so you probably can benefit from this as much as your athletes, if not more, because you're the leader, right? And everybody's looking to, to you. And so if you have a mistake ritual, something that you can go back to, that's super powerful for your program. Okay. So again, we want athletes to compete at their, their best, not the best. We're not talking about, you know, I'm 5'9". I'm not talking about myself dunking. I'm talking about playing at my best. We need to have a knowledge base and we need to have the tools. So let's recap. We talked about the mindset of great competitors and how important it is to define what that is. We talked about what happens in the brain and the body. 
again, understanding why that happens and how it's helpful, but also understanding that your athlete's perception is so critical to that. We talk about the common barriers to high performance and why you can actually be a barrier if you're not expecting change. And finally, we talk about how to implement change in your athletes with the three P's, the pivoting, your thinking, the practicing, and the preparing. Okay, so what is the next step? So some of you might be thinking, oh, well, yeah, I got this. This is great. Thanks, Lindsay. I'm going to go implement this, and that's, that's awesome. But some of you might be thinking, you know, I've tried to implement things before, and I really need a system. I really want something that is proven, that I can look at, that I can do, that makes this process really simple because I know the devil's in the details. Now, if that's you, I want you to listen up because I have a very special package that I came up with because I've been doing this for a long time and I've worked with athletes and coaches, you know, at all different levels. And I'm really proud of that from little league to Olympians to from the top athletic departments in the country. But my heart goes out to coaches, maybe like you, that you know, are really trying to develop their skills as a coach to improve, to have a growth mentality with their own knowledge, and they're struggling to pay for uniforms. And they're never going to be the ones that spend $9,500 to bring me into work their 13. And I really, you know, I, I love sports and I really wanted to provide something for coaches that I can honestly say, this is, we have a lot of courses. We have a lot of great courses. I think that this is the one that has the most value because I'm going to bundle it with a couple other things I'll talk about in a second, but it really gives you a system because I talk to a lot of coaches and they have the best intentions to, to implement mental training and then they get lost in the details or the implementation is confusing or they have a life outside of coaching. And so good intentions really aren't enough. And so year to year, they keep trying to like band-aid it and they keep trying to like maybe try one more tool, but it's never really done in the right way. And they come to me and they just say, I just, just tell me exactly what to do. I can't afford to bring you in, but tell me exactly what to do. And that's what this training really does. Okay. So I know coaches always want to hear from other coaches. So Coach Falbo said, working through this course could not be easier. Make no mistake. What is pre presented is powerful information to change an athlete into having their best mindset heading into every practice and competition they face. This provides not only the physiological and psychological reasons for what challenges an athlete's mind, it provides the light of rationale and tools to effectively make the breakthrough with each of your athletes. And I, I have obviously loved hearing this and, and very proud of the program that we've come up with. Um, and, and it really takes a coach such as, as Coach Falbo and, and potentially you that, that wants to take this and, and implement it with their athletes to really change their lives, not just to provide better competition. I mean, that's great, and that's part of it, but really help them develop their young athletes as people. Okay, I'm gonna go into the psychology of competition, but I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the bonuses. So the first bonus, and this is only good for the next hour. So I like to reward fast action takers. I'm just like the kind of person like, if you wanna do this, do it, and you're gonna get a reward. So the first hour, I actually include a very special bonus, which is called the Mental Toughness Best Practices Guide. And this is a $49 value, but really the reason that I like this ebook is because we, we talk about a lot of um, the best practices. Um, again, the, the things that I do when I go in and work with a, an athletic department, but it also has some things that we don't really talk about other places, like how to deal with an injured athlete and some little things like that, that, you know, may not be applicable to everyone in your program, but for the people that it's applicable to, it's gonna make a huge difference in how you can coach them. Bonus number two, and this is a really big bonus. <laughs> this is the Mental Huddle Foundational Program. And we sell this for $3.99. It's also um, in our $3,000 full zone training. But the reason that I, I pulled it out and made it, made it a bonus in this is because you get 10 mental training workshops with this foundational program. And I can say that um, with our bigger trainings, this is the part of it that coaches call me up and are like, oh my goodness, my athletes loved the mental huddles. And, and so it, it provides a ton of value for you to really implement mental training over time with your athletes in a systematic and really simple way for you. This is a, this is a team actually doing a mental huddle, I love this picture. It provides great leadership opportunities. 
um, really gets everybody engaged and bought into mental training. And again, makes it really easy and simple for you. The last bonus, so the, the first one's only available for the next hour. These other two are available for the next 24 hours. And the, and the last one is how to overcome the top three mental training challenges. And I can promise you that you have experienced all of these. And, but the reason that I like this book is one, you can't buy this. This is not for sale at this point anywhere else. So this is a, a bonus that we don't sell um, except as a bonus in this um, training. But it's really simple and, it, and it's something though that you can go back to and, you can, and it gives you that framework of like, okay, my athlete's struggling with this. Oh, this is a really common one. Okay, that's in that book. And it'll give you a framework for how to deal with it. And, and I think you'll find that it's really simple but really effective. Okay, again, for the next hour, you can get all four of these trainings for $2.99, okay? So this is a $750 value. Um, but it's, this is all the stuff that I teach when I go work with a, with a team, either online, which is the 1400 or when I go on site and I work with a team for $9,500. So we're bundling all this for $299. And again, this is because if you are that coach that wants to make a systematic change and is sick of just throwing things over the wall, sick of band-aiding the, you know, the mental training aspect of your team and you're ready to move forward with a system, then I want this to be affordable for you. And so this is a lot of value and something that's really simple to, to implement. And I'm going to go into the psychology of competition. I'm going to show you what it actually looks like on the back end. But I want you to just think about going through this. And we actually give you a certificate of completion once you um, finish the last um, quiz. And so that's kind of cool. It's kind of good for your resume and something you can hang and show your athletes. Okay, so let me show you. So the website is positiveperformancetraining.com forward slash P forward slash game face to get started and enroll. Um, okay, so. Let's talk about, so this is, I just want you to see real quick. So you can see more information about what's in the training and the bonuses um, and all that and some quotes and some testimonials um, from different coaches that have used it. But this is what you do. You go and you en enroll today. And if you do it in the next hour, again, you're going to all those things. This is all secure. So you can put your stuff in and, and you're going to get instant access. And this is what your account's going to look like as soon as you log in. Okay, hold on. I think there we go. Okay, so this is what this is my account. And so you're going to get again, you're going to get the mental huddle foundational course, you're gonna get the psychology of competition coaches certification program, you're going to get both of these mental uh, toughness and mental training ebooks if you purchase in the next hour. Um, and the first hour, this one goes away, but then you get all the rest of them. Um, if you purchase in the next 24 hours, okay. So let's show you a little bit about the psychology of competition. So this is a, a course that, again, everything that I talked about today, we go in deeper. So you're going to have worksheets. You can go through the arousal um, exercise with your athletes. Let me show you that one. Um, there we go. So you can just print out these arousal uh, uh, exercises for your athletes. Get full worksheets that you can use with your athletes. They're videos. Um, and so this just, yeah, and you could download that right, right there. So you're going to get all this stuff. You're going to get pre-competition, during competition, again, worksheets, exercises, videos to take your athletes exactly through how to develop the mistake ritual and how to practice it. So the next one is pre-competition highlight reel. So we have two exercises, um, two modules on pre-competition. Then during competition is the mistake ritual. This is so important. Um, and really walks you through how to teach this and implement it with your athletes. And then post-competition routine. A lot of people, well, most athletes don't have a post-competition routine. They're either happy or sad, as you've probably seen. And this gives you a really solid plan for post-competition. Doesn't take a lot of time. Super, super effective. Plus, we have some bonus material um, and bonuses for um, just different resource, resources. Um, so that gives you just a ton of resources to use with your athletes. So the psychology of competition alone has months of training material that you can use with your athletes. But if, again, if you purchase in the next 24 hours, I add in the Mental Huddle Foundational program. Now, Mental Huddle Foundation is made up of Mental Huddle workshops, and I can show you what one of these look like. So here we go. So these are printable PDFs that you can take and you can take into your locker room and say, okay, team, every Friday we're gonna meet together, we're gonna do this Mental Huddle. And there's videos, there's um, different exercises that you're going to do, there's challenges, there's uh, um, questions that are going to come up, um, 
this is the, did I just do that one? Maybe I just did that one. Yeah. Um, so this one is physical toughness. So there's a video to watch. Um, and, and there's also guided visualizations. So let me show you what that looks like. So at the end of the mental huddles, not only do you get the 10 mental huddles to do with your team, and these are like DIY mental training workshops, um, you also get what we call the athlete's toolbox. And so you're going to get all these guided visualizations to work with your team. So essentially at the end of every mental huddle, there's an optional guided visualization for you to do with your team. And this is about them, you know, rest and recovery. These are different relaxation exercises. And you literally download these and press play. And athletes love these. And again, this is getting into them learning how to control their own mind. So you can say, great competitors control their own minds, control your mind. But if you're not practicing it with them, it's like telling them they should be more flexible and not helping them learn a stretching routine. These audio guided visualizations, one, are just a great stress reducer for everybody in your program. They're very bonding because everybody does them together but they're also teaching your athletes on a really deep level that they're in control of their mind, they're practicing it. And again, we got some bonus material here. So between the mental huddles and the psychology of competition and the eBooks, you're getting like six months of weekly mental training resources to use with your team, okay? So you're gonna get a lot for that 299 um, that you can use with your athletes. So let me go through uh, a couple other things that I need to talk about. Um, so again, this is positiveperformancetraining.com. Let me go back to the PowerPoint so you can see the PowerPoints. Share screen. Okay. So it's power, it's uh, positiveperformancetraining.com forward slash P forward slash game face. And again, you have an hour to get all the bonuses and 24 to get three of the four. So what if my athletes don't buy in? Because I hear that a lot. Before I get into some Q&A, and again, you can put your questions down below. Um, but I get, you know, some pretty important objections. And I want to go over some of those um, because I've, I've heard all of them and, and I, I totally get it. So you might be thinking, what if your athletes don't buy in? And I would say, you know, one, this, the first part of all this is you. And that's why this is a coach's certification program. This is for you to develop yourself as a coach. We can't control everybody in our life. This is for you to develop your coaching skills. But I will say that your athletes, again, it comes down to you expecting that amazing, right? And worst case scenario, we're talking about you can develop half of their mindset. And even worst case scenario is, Maybe there's one athlete that you know needs this information. Maybe there's just one. And maybe that athlete was like me that was going to quit at 16 and found a coach that helped me understand that I was in control of my mind and my whole life changed. So sometimes we think, well, if I don't, you know, if, my, if, my, if 15 out of 15 of my athletes aren't better after this, then it's a waste of time. But that's not true. And you don't, you don't believe that anyway. You know, you're a coach and you know that you're, you, there's going to be those couple athletes that you change their life. And this training can help you do that. You're worried about time, your own, and your athletes. And, um, you know, definitely a legitimate concern. But I will say that you're already spending time on this. If you're here listening to this training, this is a problem in your program. You're already having one-on-one -on -one calls with your athletes or talking to the parents or talking to them before games or after games. And so my guess is that you're spending way more time than this course is going to take band-aiding these things. Band-aiding is not a word, but I use it. <laughs> and so, you know, they say a, a ounce of prevention is worth a pound of, wait, an ounce of, yeah, worth a pound of cure. Yeah. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so really this is the proactive approach and, and I will say also that I believe in mental training and I believe in consistent mental training. I don't think it has to take a lot of time. So let's say you go through the course and it takes like three hours to, you know, understand it all. And then maybe you meet once a week with your athletes. Maybe you do a pre-practice five minute routine. And then maybe on Fridays you meet um, and you do a mental huddle that takes about 30 minutes. But maybe you don't even do that. Um, you know, but again, I think whatever time you can invest in this, 
is time that you're already spending reacting to these things. Because if you're here, I know this is an issue in your program. You might be thinking you've always just gotten this kind of information for free. How is this different? And I'll say this. You can get a lot of things for free. This masterclass is for free. We have all kinds of free stuff on our website. Um, but in my experience, systems are worth it when they're good. Um, and so, yes, you can learn about the mistake ritual. You can maybe learn about some questions to ask after the game. But if you don't have a system, the devil's really in the details. And we've done this for many, many years. And so, you know, it's really, it's taken us a lot of time to figure out what to teach and when and how and how much and all these little things. That, and, and again, you know, some of that will be changed for your program too. And you'll, you'll do a little implementations that are different, little tweaks. We also have a private Facebook group that um, a lot of people talk about how they've done it. And so you can learn from other coaches, but having a baseline system in my experience saves a ton of time. So yeah, free can be good and free can be valuable, but there's really nothing more valuable than just someone telling you exactly what to do when. Doesn't that sound nice? I love that. I love when I actually get that out of something. So you might be thinking, what if you don't like it? I don't think we've ever had anybody not like this one. We've had, a, we've had maybe one or two on other trainings in the past, um, but we do have a money back guarantee. Um, if you go through the training and you don't like it or you didn't, it wasn't what you thought. Um, and, and you know, that really comes down to, to me and our company. I don't want you spending your money with us if it's not what you need. That's not how I run my business. So, um, you know, that's not really an issue for us at least, but I just want to ensure you of that. Now the final thing is, can I think about it? Sure. But I think you either, you, you kind of know in your gut. So it's like, what's that inner voice? Like, are you ready to stop doing the same old crap you've been doing, band-aiding it, you know, or, or throwing things against the wall or, or trying things, but not really sure if they're working. If you are ready, I think, you know, um, but you have, you do have an, you have a day to figure it out. Um, so, you know, that there's that, but again, I think, and those are really, that's why I, I, I really love fast action takers because I think at this point, you know, if this is the leap that you as a coach are ready for and and if your program you're ready to take them to the next level so um, you can certainly think about it but I think you already know okay so that is the psychology of competition coaches certification program so I'm going to remind you of the bonuses so we have psychology of coaches competition um, psychology of competition coaches certification and that's generally 299 so today in the next hour you're gonna get the psychology of competition coaches certification for 299 plus you're going to get two ebooks, one best practices, one the top three mental training challenges. And you can certainly share those with your, your staff or your colleagues as well. And then the final thing is a $3.99 bonus, which is our mental huddle foundational program. And again, with all of that, you're going to get like five or six months of weekly mental training. If you chose to do it with your team, um, weekly mental training um, resources to use with your team. Okay. So now we're going to go into a couple questions and you can certainly put in more in the chat box. If I don't get to them right away, um, we'll go back and Chantel's texting me some of them so that I don't have to get on and try to manage all this together. So I'm going to read some of the ones that um, Chantel is sending over, but feel free to put your, yours in there. Okay. So uh, Coach Johnson, can I use this with my team? Yes. And I don't know if I mentioned that already, but that's why this, is, this package is probably the best value that we've ever offered because a lot of our, our trainings are for a single person, right? And like you can go in and you can learn and they're great and you'll, you'll learn a lot individually, but they're not licensed to use with your team because we sell them for, as team packages. But the psychology competition, you can use that with your whole team and the mental huddles are definitely designed to use with your whole team. So again, you're getting essentially what we sell to, um, you know, whether I go in and work with a team or we have our online trainings for teams that are, you know, start at basically a thousand dollars, you're getting all of that for two ninety nine. dollars So, um, it's really the best value that, that we've ever put together. So, okay. Lori says, how do we deal with different arousal levels for athletes that need different things for pre, during and post competition? A great, great question. 
And again, we go into this more in module four of the psychology of competition, but just quickly the, you know, the, the, the thing that I love about athletes really going through this entire process is it's really about self-awareness um, first. And so letting athletes come to that awareness on their own. And, you know, as a coach, you might have things that you need to talk to them about and say, you know, well, what if you did, what if you were a little bit more hyped up? Do you think you might play better? Um, and, and things like that. But the first thing is, is kind of tapping to that self-awareness and recognizing that they do have a lot of knowledge because they probably likely depending on their age, they played a lot of games and then potentially sharing that with the team or sharing that with coaches and understanding that everybody does have different levels of arousal that they need. So like, for example, I told you I was like a seven or an eight. I was pretty pumped up before competition. I had a teammate that <laughs> she was like, she was from the Caribbean. And so she was like kind of always chill, always laid back. And as a competitor, I think that was sort of hard for me at first. Cause I'm like, like wake up, but she would wake up can't come game time, but she would wake up as far as how she was playing, but she never really <laughs> showed a lot. You know, she just, she was just more chill, more even. And, and, you know, if you go through this exercise, both as a coach and for your athletes, they really start understanding themselves. I think on a, sorry, they start understanding each other and themselves on a deeper level. And they start respecting people's pre-competition routines, how people get themselves mentally ready, where their teammates need to be from an arousal standpoint. And so that's pretty cool. That's kind of an ancillary um, benefit to going through the training. But, you know, that's an important part, too. And I think a lot of times coaches, if we're, we're really competitive, a lot of times we're very competitive and hyped up. And respecting that you have athletes that may not be there, um, I think, is a good exercise for us as well. Okay, um, let's see what else. Other questions are coming up. Um, oh, this is a good one. Um, you wanna get reimbursed from your school, how do you do that? So um, I, I, I get this a lot and I can't say for sure how or and, you know, what your process is, um, but we do have a place on, um, you can take screenshots of the syllabus and a certificate of completion, and you'll also get a receipt as soon as you purchase. So um, that should do it. Um, if you're trying to get reimbursed, um, that can be good. Okay, Coach Holmes, will the mental huddles work with athletes that have different arousal levels? Um, yes, and I think you know the mental huddles are. Let's see, there's there's a, there's ten of them, right? So there we talk about motivation, we talk about passion, we talk about physical toughness and physical discomfort with, especially with, you know, preseason training and that sort of thing. We talk about having a growth mentality. There are topics all over the map um, and, and team accountability. And so one thing that I recommend for coaches is to have your athletes start running them. And this creates amazing leadership opportunities, amazing buy-in. Um, and usually the coaches are present, but not always. Um, and certainly for some of them, it's maybe not helpful, um, like the team accountability. But the mental huddles really bring teams together and, again, have them talking about mental training with a common language, a common understanding, and recognizing that everybody has their own um, way of doing things and respecting that, but also, especially with like things like the psychology of competition, giving them new tools to try. Like maybe they've never done um, – Module two, once you're in psychology competition, you'll see module um, two, or actually it's three, is a highlight reel exercise. So if they've never learned how to visualize, they get to learn how to create essentially their first highlight reel um, visualization exercise that's made up of their own best performances. And so that's like a critical, uh, I guess it's not critical, but it's a, it's a great life skill. And so exposing them to all these different tools that you'll see in all, in all this training, but then really giving them the time to figure out what works for them. I mean, such as like the mistake ritual, they're going to choose their own word um, and, and play with it and, and figure out their, their hand signal and they get that ownership. So it's really, really important. Okay. Coach Johnson asks about 
uh, mistake ritual? Should we have one for the team or for individual athletes? Um, you know, that's a really great question. I actually get that a lot. And uh, some teams do both. Um, some just let athletes do their individual. Um, an, an ancillary question for that sometimes is should people share it? Totally a personal decision. Um, some people like their, their teammates and their coaches knowing their reset words. Some people don't. I didn't. I wanted, well, also our team wasn't doing it. It was just me, but I wouldn't have wanted someone. Now I wouldn't have mind someone say, okay, Lindsay, you know, you just missed that shot. I see you like do your mistake ritual. And so it's really nice when everybody's doing it all together, but some teams do do their own to, or sorry, some, some teams do, um, uh, mistake ritual for the team. So they have a team word, a team hand signal, and that can be kind of cool. Um, I've had a lot of teams do that and that can be really bonding and really, um, just a really good anchor for when things are sort of going off the rails and everybody can kind of feel it and everybody's kind of looking at each other and like, Oh, you know, Oh God, here we go. That can be a really good anchor. Um, but I always like to leave the door open for someone to do their own because I think mental training is both great when it's done as a team. There's sort of a magic to that, but I also think it can be really personal. And so I think I'm always trying to, um, balance that for teams, especially in team sports, individuals sometimes are a little bit different, but, um, but not always. And so, um, hopefully that answers your question on that. All right. So any other questions you can put them down below and I will get to them or Chantel will get to them later. So again, you have an hour to purchase, um, the psychology competition at 299 and get th those additional three bonuses. You have 24 hours to get the additional two. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. I hope that this, um, whether you join us or not, uh, moving forward with the, with the trainings, um, that this last hour really gave you some tools and some things to think about and some things to really implement with your program. And if there's ever anything that I can do or my team can do to help you and your program and your development as a coach, um, please do not hesitate to let us know because I see what you're doing. I see the struggle of so many coaches doing such great work and, and really changing young people's lives. And I have so much respect for what you do and anything that, that I or my team can do to help you with that. Please don't hesitate to let us know. And finally, you can connect with me on Twitter at Lindsay Wilson 13, and I'll show you the website again too. So positiveperformancetraining.com. Here are the bonuses. Positiveperformancetraining.com forward slash P forward slash game face. And I hope if, if this is right for you that you join us so that we can stay connected and you can take this training and implement it with your program and continue to do the great work that you're doing. Okay, bye for now.